This is the story of a moment in the lives of a generation. 25 years ago, Britain went two-tone. Led by the specials, a bunch of young groups lit up the charts with a potent homegrown mix of British and Jamaican music. They brought with them a look that combined black and white street styles. It wasn't just Britain's first multiracial music. It was a rich and contradictory movement born of turbulent times and the growing pains of multiculturalism. And as two-tone bands toured the country, many in the audience were changed forever. The special surfaced in the summer of 1979, within months of Margaret Thatcher's election as Prime Minister. They seized their moment. It just threw me. It was just, it was superb. It was just, it, I suddenly thought, here is something that I can really, really hang on to. You just can't escape the message with the specials. You can't escape the specials. You couldn't then, and if you hear it now, you can't. After punk, the music industry was desperate to sign the next big thing. The specials were able to set their own terms. Instead of signing a deal for the group, they signed for their label, Two Tone. They soon launched other bands, including Madness, as well as The Selector and The Beat. Two Tone had a distinctive look and its own sound, a fusion of rock and ska. For the audience, Two Tone's inclusive message made it more of a movement than a fad. It was Two Tone that, for me, really consolidated the coming together of politics and music and youth voices for a new Britain. It all seemed to happen overnight, but Two Tone was actually weaving together strands of post-war popular culture that stretched back to the 1940s. The first Jamaican settlers arrived in Britain in June 1948. Among the 500 or so passengers on the Windrush, 20 listed their profession as musician. The new arrivals bought ska, a lively dance music like an inside-out rhythm and blues. Ska and the reggae which followed it would soon become as much a part of British music as Indian food became a part of British eating. I belong to that group of people who were born in England to the children of immigrant parents. Coming from the Caribbean, my, my mum brought a wind-up gramophone and we used, to, we used to listen to 78s of Trinidad and Calypso. I grew up in Southall uh, in the 60s and 70s and there was a, a classical singer called Dansen and my dad used to love his stuff and it was all very kind of, oh, that kind of stuff. I was probably the only Asian in my whole area. You felt like you ought to like something deep and meaningful, but, you know, I'm, I'm a, I love pop music and it's, that's all that matters to me. I moved around a lot as a kid, mainly around London, um, all over the place. You know, I was thought of reggae and ska and all that as British music, you know, I didn't really know where it was from. <laughs> it was just part of the pop firmament. <laughs> Rico Rodriguez brought his trombone to London. In Jamaica, he played on some of the earliest ska tracks. Yeah, me left Jamaica 61 December. We come to England on a Jamaican ship in Car Banana. In Britain, he carried on recording with other Jamaicans. Later, Rico, along with Dick Cuthall, became sort of eighth and ninth members of the specials, recording and touring with them throughout their career. Like everything else. I had to come out and go and play. I used to do a lot of sessions with Dan the Livingstone, who did Message to You, Rudy. He was with the Trojan Records. He used to give me a few sessions. Stop you running around, making trouble in town. Outside of West Indian communities, the biggest fans of Jamaican music were the original skinheads. A message to you. 
Skinhead had formed out of the hard end of mod, the football terrace boot boys, and the rude boy style from Kingston, Jamaica. Or you might wind up in jail. Along with their love of reggae, the skinheads took both their too short trousers and their close cropped hair from West Indian immigrants. Skinhead reggae became a distinct and distinctly British thing. As a teenager, it was all the scar stuff. It was that was the era 69, 70, all those great records coming through, the Desmond Deckers and stuff. But also, we used to go down Lewisham Market and get the Jamaican scar stuff as it came in. My mother was Jewish, I was from Dagenham, my father was Nigerian and went back to Nigeria um, after I was born and I was adopted into a white working class English family. Because I was the only black kid, it was easier to be the mascot of the skinheads <laughs> than anything else. So, and I really, really liked their music. And they used to play ska music and long shot kick the bucket and some reggae music, and they were deeply into Tamla and, and soul. And so that's where I began hearing all those records. I mean, I came to black music, in a way, through white skinheads. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things that's really important to understand about this Brit skinhead reggae phenomenon was that it, it could quite easily coexist with a kind of antipathy, a hatred for, the, for, for black people. I mean, there were a few, you know, there always is the problematic presence of a few black skinheads. And of course, their sense of who they were after was qualified by their desire to, to, to engage in what they called then Paki bashing. But what exactly do you do when you see Pakistanis? Well, sometimes we eat them, sometimes we just leave them. Packies ain't so much your enemy, they're just like a pastime, aren't they? Packies. <laughs> just jump on them. It's not their colour, cos, you know, the Jamaicans are all right. A lot of Jamaican mates. I mean, they don't like Pakistanis either. At that point, you know, we had grown up with the whole Enoch Powell sort of speeches. We'd grown up with the National Front. We were fully aware of um, our parents getting abused in the streets. In this country, in 15 or 20 years time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. Powell's opinions were off the scale of respectable politics, but they set the tone for racists and neo-Nazis who kept themselves visible through the 70s. They were usually skinheads in their ranks and street style continued to get mixed up with street politics. In 1977, the National Front organised a provocative march through Lewisham in south-east London, an area inhabited by both poor blacks and poor whites. These were some of the ugliest scenes of violence London has seen this year. At the riot which ensued, it wasn't just fascists fighting anti-fascists for control of the streets, it was skinheads versus punks. It was very tribal, but, you know, I've got friends and that it was a war for them. You know, if you came from the suburbs and your hair was blue, and you came up to town, man, you know, you were lucky to get out alive. And it was, but that's what I'm saying was interesting, because, you know, this mob I've met, some of them, this sort of teddy boy thing was a big thing at that time. And then suddenly this division, you know, like someone turned up in a pair of leather trousers, old on, he's gone punk. So come on down along the way, now the song a little way is out Mid-70s reggae no longer made much sense to skinheads, but punks were drawn to it. It was as though fast and trebly punk was the other half of unhurried, bass-heavy reggae. Punk groups started trying to fit the two together. We were really interested in the recording process because they made fantastic records in four-track studios, and that's where we were making our records. We used to try and copy the dub guitar, right? It was a reggae thing. In the studio, he'd have a repeat going, jing, 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 jing. But the white boy playing the reggae, he used to go, jing, 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 jing. So we would check, check out the little chops, and, and we would learn a lot of them. It was great. It was a great time. A lot of the encounter between punk and reggae took place at concerts for Rock Against Racism, which had been formed in 1976 out of indignation provoked by blues musician Eric Clapton. Despite being deeply in debt to black music, Clapton had made a speech in support of Enoch Powell, although he denies being racist. Rock Against Racism, the punk reggae interface, says that racism will not be an issue in this popular culture, that what makes this popular culture tick, what makes it work, what makes it beautiful, what makes it compelling, are all premised on the exclusion of racism from the public world that's there. 
Rock Against Racism built up from small concerts that would pair one punk group with one reggae group to the huge event at Victoria Park in Hackney, at which The Clash topped the bill. That really, for me, was the first time that I felt really comfortable about being black and Asian and British at the same time in one space. The specials brought it all together. Instead of black and white bands on the same bill, there were black and white musicians in the same band. An informal collective of young musicians, keener on dancing than marching, but just as eager to reject a racist future. Here you had this whole generation of kids, black and white kids who'd grown up side by side in schools and listening to each other's music. And I mean, two-tone, as far as I'm concerned, was an experiment waiting to happen. <laughs> Instead of awkward attempts to mix rock and reggae, there was about to be a new sound. The energy of punk, brilliantly fused with reggae's faster ancestor, Ska. The specials and two-tone were born in Coventry, because that's where Jerry Dammers lived, harbouring a vision. Emphasise the offbeat like that. Then started, change, then, uh, started slowing down, and you got sort of reggae. Uh. Everyone wants you to uh, behave in, in the way they expect you to behave, but we just do what we want, you yeah. know. Yeah. I'm not going to live out other people's fantasies. Gangsters was the first two-tone single, launching a new look, a mix and match of clothes once worn by skinheads, mods and rude boys, and with it, a new ska punk sound. It wasn't until the specials that you actually had a black and white band taking that, that basic ska sound and giving it a harder rock edge and just making the lyrics all about um, the way we were living and stuff. It just seemed absolutely right and it really took off very, very fast. I felt that Coventry was some kind of multicultural haven, perhaps, you know. I'd never really been there before, but to me, I felt like, oh, maybe Coventry's the place where black and white do unite, you know, where all this cool music is coming from. You kind of thought, hang on a second, OK, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's black and white suddenly. It is black kids, white kids. Um, it is the first time, I think, probably that I'd, I'd, I'd seen that. Two-Tone had a strong graphic image, Black and white checks, bold, clear typography, and the figure called Walt Jabsko, drawn by Jerry Dammers as the archetypal rude boy. buying a black and white suit and um, getting dressed, you know, and putting on the... It was a black and white skirt and jacket and I had a white shirt on and a really thin black tie and I had white tights on and black shoes and a pork pie hat. <laughs> and I remember going and just thinking, wow. That's it, that's it. You put your pork pie hat on and you were there. You were, you were part of the gang and, of course, the Moe suits and that, yeah. It was the figure of the rude boy that made it attractive, the figure of the rude boy and not the figure of the rest not the figure of the Rastafari. In some way, they were trying to get away from that. 
I think it was the figure of the rude boy that had a different glamour, a different cool, a different style, all of that which, which made it very much more attractive to a larger, you know, and largely working class white British audience. Buster, he sold the heat With a rock steady beat The hope and anchor Possibly the most important place we came to as youngsters because it was um, the best live music venue in the area that we were living in and where I first saw the specials. I remember seeing an article about the specials in Melody Maker and being really shocked immediately by how similar they looked in dress to the way we were dressing at that time, which was unusual to be wearing suits and hats and all that. And then secondly, when I was reading the article, they seemed to be doing exactly the same kind of music that we were doing and we felt we were completely um, in our own world down here because this was literally the epicenter of me and about 15 people who had started our own completely own thing, which involved playing ska and reggae and R and B. I mean, 60s R and B and all that. And then suddenly, an advertisement appeared here in one of the posters that um, the specials were performing, and it really was a, an epiphanal moment. And I remember when the specials arrived. We were all sort of, you know, it was all a little bit, who are you, mate, and all that. And then uh, the jukebox was the kind of uh, the catalyst for our first conversation. And, um, yeah, it really is a, a very clear memory, you know, of meeting them and just realising something was suddenly going on. And then they performed downstairs, probably one of the best gigs I ever saw, certainly one of the most important for me and, and for, for, for the rest of the band, and completely informed us in, in terms of performance pretty much from there onwards. It was like Neville letting off his gun, people punching holes in the ceiling, and that energy that they had. It's funny, it's like a bit like going back to primary school. You can't actually imagine how popular music concerts could take place in such a small space. But this is where it really happened, yeah. So, so, right, that'd be the drummer and the drum kit there. <laughs> that'd be about, that's about there, actually. We've got six other people. <laughs> it's all like that, basically. Oi! And, and after the show, I got talking to Jerry, who came back and stayed at my mum's flat. And it was there that he announced that he was going to um, start a record label called Two Tone. They asked you if you're all right. you said yes. The Selector had been the title of an instrumental B side for the special's first single. Now, a band called The Selector was quickly put together with Pauline Black as singer. Specials offered us a gig, I think, at the F Club in Leeds. And we turned up and Elvis Costello was there because uh, he was going to mix their, their, um, their first album. And I remember being terribly impressed by that until he trod on my foot at the bar and I thought, Pff, and didn't apologise. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was good. Next to release a single on Two Tone with a beat from Birmingham. It was all needed, all that music was needed. It was just like, how do you get it out? Because if you go to London, no one's going to want to know. So it was lucky because we got, we got made part of the fashion. When we were put out on Two Tone, we went straight in at number six in the charts and it stuck there for Christmas. And all of a sudden, it, you know, everybody wanted to be your best friend. Every single record company wanted to sign you because anything that was on two time was the hottest thing. One edition of Top of the Pops in 1979 featured three different two-tone bands. I think the real political importance was in them as, as appearing on the television. You couldn't check out their songs and really not understand what was going on. I walk in a bar and I meet a lip. I sense danger, you like a girl as if I was some kind of a total stranger. Where, where did you get that black, black expression on your face? It really felt like they were writing very, very honest songs about their lives rather than just talking about fantasy, which a lot of pop groups do, or um, just relationships. They wrote about the reality of relationships, uh, about, you know, going to a nightclub and walking home, being bored, not having pulled, drunk, skin, all the way home at the end of the night, whatever. They, they talked about the way your lives were. The specials, the selector and madness went out together on the first two-tone tour. 
The three bands rendezvoused late one night at an M1 service station. We met the rest of the two-tone tour at the Blue Ball services. We got our own little bus up to meet them. By the time we got there, there were loads of coppers and there was chaos all over the streets. And um, rightly or wrongly, I think Lee Thompson, our saxophone player, Neville Staples and Brad all got nicked for something or other. Buster. He's so I can almost see that it was because this mixture of kids, a lot of black kids and white kids, it, was, it all seemed a bit sort of dangerous, which is what it was, really. For the coppers, you know, I could imagine now, looking back in those grey, black and white old days. But, yeah, it sort of added to the whole excitement and bonding process of us setting off on this tour. The tour started off, we were playing quite small venues, and poor old Rick Rogers, the specials manager, was, like, stopping at every phone box pre-mobile phones, <laughs> trying to get bigger venues because they were being, you know, bum-rushed, as I think the current, current vernacular. Many in the two-tone audiences didn't fit into other musical tribes. Now they had their own. There were clones of the specials in the audience. And as we did more gigs, then I began to see girls who were clones of me in the audience with a red Harrington on, you know, and, and a trilby hat. You know, you got to know loads of them, you know, a huge sort of uh, whirlpool of disparate youth sort of uh, found it what they were looking for. And I don't think at the time we realised that at all. <laughs> It was a very inclusive movement, it felt like, you know, at the time. It was the sight of black and white young men on stage performing music that harked back to a black history, to a black musical tradition, um, and combining it with quite political lyrics that reflected contemporary Britain and reflected the Thatcher's Britain that we were part of, that sense of no future, that sense of you're all on the scrap if if you if you're not part of the whole Tory movement at that time. Yeah, I mean I think a lot of people a lot of people encounter two tone and discover it in it a sense of belonging and that doesn't surprise me because it change it's part of affirming it's part of affirming a big shift in the way that British culture operates. It was unique, and in fact, I probably hadn't felt anything like it in a funny kind of, kind of way since, because it was actually me, for the first time, choosing to be part of something, as opposed to choosing to be outside of everything else. It made the encounter between black and white young people an ordinary feature of life. It, it liberated those encounters from the kind of weight they were made to bear. One such encounter happened one night after a two-tone concert. The special singer, Terry Hall, had seen someone in the audience being pushed around in a scuffle. That someone was Gurinder Chadha. He asked if I was all right, because he'd seen me get sort of chewed up a bit, and, and he went on about the fight that had happened at the concert. And then he um, said, would you like an album? You know, it's signed by all of us. And I was all like, ah! You know, of course. Ah. We started talking about, you know, my experiences and his experiences, and and of course, for me, this was actually the first time that I was talking to a white working class English boy in that way. As the two tone bus travelled the country, it became a kind of musical melting pot, a microcosm of what life could be like if more black and white people rubbed shoulders. So all the smokers were right at the back. It sort of got more laid back as you went through the bus. You know, there was more sort of amphetamine influence up the front. <laughs> the chatting and shouting, sticking your ass out the window, gang. I eat madness. <laughs> and it sort of mellowed out as you got down to the back and then through the clouds, you'd find Rico sort of, you know, king on the back, in the one big back seat. Every now and again, usually if anyone needed to go to the loo, the music would kind of collide. So I would say, hey, listen to this instead. I, you know, it was like that. But two-tone concerts were so inclusive that in the early days, some Sieg Heilin skinheads found their way in. They mainly targeted madness, two-tone's only all-white group. There were times right at the peak of it all when half the audience would be zigiling and you'd think, oh, Jesus, what on earth are we going to do? You know, if there was pockets, there was a couple of skinny jigs you have to fight, you know, you'd put the spotlight on them and stop the concert or jump in the audience and try and sort it out. 
but then suddenly you realise that it was sort of out of control. And, yeah, there was a brief period when you just thought, um, it's happened, you know. Jesus, we've been taken over by the Nazis. Better the enemy you know is the way I look at it, you know what I'm saying? And I thought, yeah. I, I, it's like when, when I say that two-tone was an experiment waiting to happen, all experiments, you start out with them and you start out with the ingredients and you might think you know what the outcome of that is going to be. There's going to be contradictory results along the way. And the skinheads or that certainly had those kind of leanings were the contradictory elements along the way. I did get up and I said, fuck off, fuck off the National Front, fuck off, fuck off the National Front. And there was a massive cheer from the majority of the audience and this small group of about 15 skinheads. They just went mad. I don't know if it was shame. I mean, as, as I've always said, there are more fascists dressed up in business suits sort of wandering around this world than there are in, in Levi's and uh, Doc Martens. Enjoy yourself. Apart from a very small handful of isolated incidents, the Nazi element didn't intrude on the specials concerts. In fact, Jerry's idea of inclusiveness meant many in the audience ended up on stage. I remember some of the top ranks, you know, they still literally had the plastic palm trees and the sprung dance floors, which meant that the PA would be going like that. And I remember a couple of nights sort of hanging on, like, you know, the rodeo or a sort of pirate on the high seas. It was, you know, it was rough. It was, it was really rough. And part of the fun for some people was the bundle. Jerry would invite the audience up as well in his inimitable style. You connected with bands like the Specials. You felt on a kind of par with them. I felt this real sense of identity. I felt a British musical, political movement was around and accessible to me that I could be part of and that I didn't mind wearing the clothes. I loved wearing the clothes and I loved being seen as part of it. You often hear people go rave and rave about why they like certain artists. But this band had number one hit singles. They were a very, very popular act and they weren't diluted in any way. Enjoy yourself! In their first year, Two Tone had topped the charts, toured the country and created a new inclusive movement. It was as if everything the label touched turned to gold. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. Enjoy yourself while you're still in the pain. The years go by as quickly as you win. 25 years after the two-tone times, Jerry Damasu is in the Victoria and Albert Museum, celebrating the history of black British style. It's good to be white. Today, the only group playing Sky and Coventry is a two tone revival band. You could only be on, but for once. We were 12 when the special split up. I think we realised how important it was, especially how important the Coventry thing was when we became older, you know, and, and now being part of the. Well, playing in, playing in Special Brew and everything, it, it means so much because we're from Coventry. Time since we were here. In this room was where the original, um, we think it was the original two turn office, it was where Jerry was living um, when the whole thing sort of exploded and they became uh, an overnight success. And uh, we came here actually, didn't we, when we were, I think we must have been about 16, and we came, came looking for Jerry Dammers long after the special split. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is our Bernie Rhodes contract. <laughs> <laughs> No, we've got loads of contracts. <laughs> Two-tone strengths were also its weaknesses. Cheerful idealism and a do-it-yourself aesthetic had helped propel Two-tone to success. <laughs> uh, what else have we got? Oh, this is our A and R department. <laughs> These are the tapes that people send us. As you see, we've been inundated. <laughs> 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 and 
this is the uh, wardrobe. But they weren't best equipped to handle that success now it had arrived. <laughs> To sign an all-woman two-tone band was an irresistible next step. Rhoda Dacca and the Body Snatchers were plucked out of nowhere. We ended up recording two-tone because on our second gig, this is bearing mind, second gig, one original song, Jerry, Pauline and um, Juliette DeVee, who was the selector's manager at the time, all came along to see us. Which, had it been our, about our fifth gig, probably would have been really daunting. But at the time, on your second gig, you're still you're not scared yet. And um, they offered us a place on the second two-tone tour and a single deal. And really, we weren't ready for any of it, truth to tell. I mean, our first time in a studio was in a 24-track studio. It's bonkers, you know. We were doing a demo in a 24-track studio. We'd never been in a studio before. It wasn't just that they were no good at business, they didn't even want to be. We were in a, our, our own worst enemies anyway, I mean, no bones about that. You know, we were an unruly lot and, uh, and very stupid a lot of the time um, and really couldn't deal with that kind of corporate um, music business end of things, which... Kids now, young kids in music, kind of deal with it at the drop of a hat. I mean, this is no big deal for them. You know, for us, we were done. It's just 14 people. That's all it is. Um, we're trying to organise some sort of uh, a legal um, way of putting it, but I don't think there is one. When we became directors of Two Tone along with the specials, that meant there were 14 people as directors. Well, that was never going to work for a start. We had some weird illusion that it might work, but, I mean, they were either in America and we were here or in Europe, and, I mean, no, no one ever really got together. When we did all got to get together, then we probably argued. They never took a break from each other. Maybe when I had amongst them for two years and work all the time, you know. They, them, 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 them didn't take a break, you know. If they're not in America, they're in the island. If they're not in Ireland, they're in Wales. If they're not in Wales, they're in Scotland, you know, the Republic of Ireland, Belgium, Germany, you know. Yeah, that band didn't take a break. Where it used to be fun, <laughs> it started going downhill. But it used to be fun. The period of the specials, around Coventry, everything used to be great. Then after a while, it, things just seemed to die out. It's hard to explain. Jerry Dammer's musical ambitions weren't ever going to be satisfied by reinventing Scar. The second specials album, More Specials, pushed into new sonic landscapes influenced by reggae and the cheesy percussion sounds of piped music. It was a sound that even some of the other specials found a bit too challenging. When it comes to the second album, the special tend to have gone from the live, hard-hitting, scar, rocky, to Muzak. We tend to have let... Well, Jerry tend to have gone to more Muzak on the second album, which, I don't know, I guess that probably... Frightened some of us, I guess. I'm, I'm not even sure, but I don't even know what happened there. But it, it just went that way. It did seem as it went on. It, Jerry had a vision, and and the rest of the band had a struggle uh, finding their place within that vision. But amongst its wider audience, the new sound was appreciated. They were already a brilliant band, and I, I, could, I could easily equate it with the Beatles, you know, going from She Loves You to the psychedelic stuff. You know, it was kind of like that. If they'd just done a, if they'd done a second album, exactly the same as the first, it, uh, probably we wouldn't have been talking about them today, but because they developed, that's when they ended up doing things like Ghost Town. Ghost Town was Jerry's masterpiece but he failed to take the rest of the band along with him. They fought over the recording in the studio, even as rioters fought with police in the world outside. 
I heard this story of Limbaugh rushing in and going, what the fuck have you done to the brass? It's all fucking out of tune. It's horrible. And that's what you did here the first time you read it. Jesus Christ, nails down the blackboard. But that's what made it such a genius record. In Leeds, the police found they'd run out of riot shields as trouble broke out at dawn. Ghost Town seemed to sum up everything that was going on. An uneasy peace has now returned to South Auburn. This time. Brixton is tense. <laughs> Today, the mopping up and the post mortems. And as the inner cities of England exploded in anger at the police, Terry, Neville, and Linville left the specials to form the Fun Boy Three. A lot of people think because um, we stopped performing because there was a lot of fights going on in the audience. That's not the reason. The reason why we, we broke up was because uh, we were on the, living on top of each other and we were on each other's nerves. That's the, uh, the reason why we broke up. The specials weren't the only two-tone band who spent half their time arguing. But what is wrong with that? Why, why, why does anyone imagine that just because black and white people are suddenly in a band together, everyone's going to get along like a house on fire? This is some white middle-class utopia that wouldn't it be nice if everybody loved each other? It wasn't a Pepsi Cola advert, you know? It was, it was real life. Outside there, in the street, people weren't getting along with each other. Now the unofficial anthem of civil strife Ghost Town was number one in the charts as Prince Charles wed Lady Diana. While official Britain put out the flags, the counterculture had voted with its music. We really need to focus on the place of Ghost Town as a very important kind of cultural event in not only providing a, a sort of coincidence that helps to explain that uh, incredible wave of rioting, but also in offering a kind of explanation for it afterwards and in, 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 in tapping into all those historic forces that produced it in the first place. It's a really incredible coincidence. It's an incredible um, encounter that brings all those different dynamics together in that way. The specials will always be remembered for me as putting politics and music and a youth voice on the agenda, you know, in Britain at that time. And I think Ghost Town was the seminal song for that period. To me, they seem to be about inner city energy and anger. And they were the sound, they were the soundtrack to the riots, but they were also the soundtrack that made you think there might be some optimism. We were different for sure, but I don't know we ever made a record as brave, you know, either sonically or as, as content as that. All right, we're back on cue now. OK. In 2004, Madness are returning to their roots. <laughs> From the asylum seeker. With producer Dennis Bovell, they're recording ska and reggae covers as their alter ego band, The Danger Men. The sun is on the rise once again. A new look version of the beat, without some original members, are also back in business, mindful of how the present connects with the past. The reason why I reformed the beat is because I have seen this racism coming back for the last four or five years. And this kind of music is needed. We need to re-educate the youths, because they don't know nothing. They don't know nothing about getting on with other people. They don't know nothing about love and unity. They will never know the difference. They will grow up and be as racist as their grandfathers and grandmothers were. You know, we broke it up for a generation, and it's coming back. Boomtown, Ghost Town, like Jerry's suit, it's all in a museum now. So how do young musicians now connect to the influence of the specials? And how does the legacy of two-tone relate to the multicultural landscape of today?
Now does London like to skank? Well, you like this one then. Little Bitch was the first song a teenage Jerry Dammers ever wrote. Now it's in the repertoire of The Ordinary Boys, a band from Worthing who weren't even born when Ghost Town was in the charts. The Ordinary Boys have been influenced by the late 70s, just as the Britpop bands, a decade ago, were influenced by the 60s. I remember hearing the specials for the first time and it's just it's just one of those those bands that you just kind of think that yeah this is the music that I was intended to listen to like my ears were made for this stuff Part of the band's route to the specials lies in their experience of growing up on the south coast The area is now home to many asylum seekers and refugees and towns like Worthing are having trouble adjusting Read in the paper, apparently it's the most xenophobic town in uh, England, apparently. I don't know how they work this out. Some kids are sort of used to hang around and still do they live in Brighton. A lot of them came over sort of when I was quite young from places like uh, Zimbabwe and Ghana. And then when they came over, they were sort of listening to Bob Marley and a lot of modern like ragga and dance floor stuff. And it was really bizarre that I sort of started listening to that. And then as I got a bit older, I was sort of searching deeper into the like Trojan reggae. And, uh, and then obviously like, onto the two time. And former special singer Terry Hall ended up appearing in an Ordinary Boys video because his son is one of their fans. I think what they sing about is as, as relevant today as it always has been. I mean, I, you know, I was born in, in 1982 and, and yeah, it was over with, but I still have been able to apply their lyrics so much to, to, to my life. There is a line, there is a seam, it's like a seam of coal, a, a, a seam of diamonds that runs from the two-tone period into the present moment. This ain't the down, it's the upbeat, make it complete. So what's the story, guaranteed accuracy, enhanced CD? The Streets record was, was very faithful to the spirit of two-tone. In fact, one of those songs actually has a trombone in it, which is very, very reminiscent of, of, of the trombone in Ghost Town, of the trombone of Rico Rodriguez in in the specials record. So I think it, it, there's a kind of homage there. There's an acknowledgement there of the, of the sort of the moral centre as well as the creative innovations of that period that does still sort of circulate in the present. A lot has changed in Britain since the days of two-tone. Though a black judge is still not a common sight. At least in music, race is now pretty much invisible. You get more Asian guys, you get more black guys, you get more white guys talking the lingo and dressing the same, and, and yeah, it's a bit better, a lot better. In the music business now, it, it's more like it doesn't matter what colour you are. As long as you, you're good enough, you can get in. I, I've been hearing a lot of Indian music getting into the charts for the first time, you know, and to me, that's changed as well, because you'd never have seen that 20 years ago. In my new film, In Bride and Prejudice, um, one of the songs, I actually told the music director, the composer, that I wanted to do a scar song. At least one of my Bollywood songs had to have a scar influence. And in the film, it's no life without wife, which starts with a very scar beat. Lonely Mr. Coley from Los Angeles Came to Punjab on one bent knee He had a green card, new house, big cash So made a wish with every fallen lash That scar influence remained part of me as a British artist, if you like. This is the original of one of the ones that we do. Two-tone lives on not just in its political or musical legacy, but in the very personal effect it had on those individuals, black, brown or white, who experienced it as a turning point in their lives and in their relationship to British culture. It shaped me kind of politically, musically, probably as a person as well to a large extent. It made me feel kind of more confident, really, about 
partly about feeling that, that the society I was in, particularly younger people, were, oh, perhaps they did have something in common with me, perhaps, yeah, perhaps I was part of this. What they made me realise was that it was OK to turn your back on what was being offered and go and seek out something else. And uh, whether it was reading about them in the NME or, or, or buying their singles or watching them on the television or going to see them live, they were really, really inspiring. It was probably one of the biggest sea changes that happened you know, to me, it has happened to me in, in my life. You know, for so long we've been sold on the idea that our future in terms of racial politics in Britain is defined by an American experience, by a US experience, that the US is our sort of racial destination. And that's either good, you know, we have a civil rights movement, or bad, we have race war, as prophesied by Enoch Powell. And what it seems to me that the specials show is that actually we don't have to be bound to a US future, that actually we can make our own future from our own history and from our own sort of post-industrial tempo of culture, that we can improvise and create and fold the history of things like two-tone, fold the history of things like Rock Against Racism back into that creation. For me, for my coming of age, it really was the first time there was something around that I felt a part of, and it was a part of Britishness that I could definitely buy into. After Ghost Town, Jerry recruited some new specials, and finally, in March 1984, released a song that would be remembered not for its musical complexity, but for the clarity of its message. It may seem odd now, but a lot of people hadn't even heard of Nelson Mandela until Jerry Dammers brought his plight to their attention. As political as music gets, I think it was hugely influential, yes. And when I watched the news and saw people at a, um, an anti-apartheid rally in South Africa singing Free Nelson Mandela, obviously, you know, when you know you, when, when that's happened, you know you've made, you've made a real impact. I'm very pleased, I think, that here we are, 25 years down the road, and enough good music was made that I think the idea of two-tone has become more real in people's minds and has become a bigger reality than the individual bands that made it up. Um, I feel that, you know, Walt Jabsko, the little two-tone man, he kind of stands for something. <laughs> Music really promote racial harmony. To join the debate, go to channel4.com slash origination. Well, if you've got the cash, they've got your ticket. Next Monday at 11, meet Alan Slim, the touts on tour. Next tonight, though, how a low-budget Bollywood film took India by storm in putting the fun in fundamental.